Here we are on the screen. Book of Jeremiah, 17th chapter, is what we're going to go through today. And it's going to be a strange one. I have uh, chosen a title that says, This One Thing. And, and I've chosen the scripture that says this one thing. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This, of course, is the desire and the zeal, the active zeal in the hearts and lives of those who love the Lord. This is the Apostle Paul saying this. Even after years and years and years of, of miraculous moves of God in his life, many things that he went through, such as shipwreck, he was stoned even, left for dead. He was, he was uh, I think it was five times he was whipped with 39 stripes. And uh, he was rejected by his own countrymen. There was many things he went through, but the, the Lord used him tremendously in establishing churches, winning souls of Christ, having them filled with the Holy Spirit, and God was using him definitely as a great apostle in his day. Chosen indeed of God. And this one thing, this one thing, I do. I do is emphasized because that is always seems to be, but especially in this one, the very core thought of the messages that God gives me. Because it's not just in faith, but it's in faith and action, things that you do. And so this was not only a desire of Paul, but it was, it was something that he sought for, he, he worked for, and he pursued for. And as you know, the scripture says when he came to the end of his days, he said, I've fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But he says, not only for me, but for all those who love his appearing. How many love the appearing of the Lord? Amen. Looking for that great day. Amen. Well, as we go into this chapter today in Jeremiah, Jeremiah has proven to be a book of woe, a book of judgment, and all the way through for 52 chapters, it was basically, I'd say not on all of them, but for a major part of the chapters, are the judgments upon God's people because they refused to seek God. Not only did they refuse to seek God, they refused him. They rejected God. He said, they've left me, they've rejected me, the fountain of living waters. And they have chosen cisterns that bear no water, that cannot hold water. Referring to the living water, which is typical of many people today as it has been uh, throughout the ages, that people choose darkness rather than light. 
But with every chapter, there's a tremendous move of God in his mercy and compassion to draw people to himself, to encourage them to return to him. And so it should let it be a blessing to you today. I must say that I feel like saying every time we go through a message like this, that it's important that you see the judgment, but look not only at the judgment, Look at the reason for the judgment and look at what God is doing. He uses judgment to bring us to God. He uses, uses testings to draw us closer to him. These, this is the strange way of God. This is, this is God's way. Praise the Lord. But he doesn't just do that, just judgment. He gives us his word. And that's the key. We need to accept these words and recognize that's the only answer. The, the, anything else is temporary, but his word is eternal and we can depend upon it. As we begin here, uh, in the first four verses, it starts out, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. What that means is this, this is something uh, that I should include the rest of that statement. It's with the point of a diamond. The diamond is one of the hardest surfaces or uh, materials to use in even cutting metal. And so he's emphasizing here that this, the sin is deep. It's not just like you would take a, a Sharpie that would wash out if it got wet or smeared and, and wrote the sin of Judah. This is, this is written with a pen of iron and with the point of a diamond. So he's saying this is, this is deep. This is really deep into the hearts of the people of Judah. It is graven upon the heart, table of their heart, and upon the horns of your altars, even in their worship. They don't follow the worship correctly. And the, the most serious part is the next verse that said, whilst their children remember their altars, and the groves by the green trees upon the green hills. The children remember this. The children see this. The children are influenced by this, which is uh, something that the Lord uh, just can't stand. He's got a heart for young people. He's got a heart for the, for the youth. He stresses that if anybody is to uh, how does it go? If any, if anyone is to deceive, these are my words, deceive or mislead uh, or discourage a little one, it is better for them that a millstone was tied around their neck and they were cast into the sea. That's the word of the Lord. That's the way he looks at this. It's terrible. This is very serious, he's saying. Amen. Verse 3 says, O my mountain in the field, I will give thy substance and all thy treasures to the spoil and the high places for sin throughout all thy borders. The mountain in the field here is referring to uh, the kingdom. Uh, in the field, the, the kingdom that is active here on the ground. And it's, it's talking about his people. It's talking about his, his whole group, his whole kingdom here of Judah. And he says, I will give your substance and treasures to the spoil. 
and he's going to destroy the places of sin throughout all the borders, all the land. He's going to do this. And the fourth verse, and thou, even thyself, emphasis here, shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not, for you have kindled a fire in mine anger that shall burn forever. The scripture can't be broken. It's, it's true. This scripture will be fulfilled to the end and to the nth degree, as we say. And what he's saying here is that it, it is a serious thing to not walk with God. It's a critical thing for your own benefit, for your own um, uh, future, your life your livelihood, everything. It is a serious thing to walk outside the grace of God. So let's go on. Do you think it applies today? Have we seen that today? Oh, yes. Is it important today? Yes. 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 So the Old Testament is applicable for today. Amen. Right. Yes. So here we go with verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departeth from the Lord. What do you think he's saying here? That's obvious to understand at verse, but this is the gospel. We, we might word it a little differently. We might start with a happy note. We might start with the happy news. But he says, Cursed is a man that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departs from the Lord. Again, the, the, the thought that the Lord gives me every time we come to a verse, especially this one, but a verse like this, is that this is a message to God's people. How is it applicable today? Most people, when they, when they interpret this verse and verses like it, they relate it to saved or unsaved. But look at it more closely. It said, whose heart departeth from the Lord. It's talking to the saved. That's what it's saying. He's talking to his people. In the Old Testament, he chose a people, did he not? Yes. He chose the children of Israel. They are termed as God's people. That would relate to, we know how this comes together. We know that, that in, in our day, because of Jesus Christ, we are included in this group of God's people. But we must not lose sight of the fact that he is speaking to God's people, not to the unsaved. He's speaking to God's people. Cursed is a man that departs from the Lord. And then look at the result. For he shall be like the heath in the desert. That's a plant that is dry and uh, not very, I don't know if very many people will like the plant. But anyway, it's like a desert plant. Shall not see when good comes. They don't even recognize when good comes. See, these are metaphors. He shall be like. It's like a, like a, a, a simile. Mm -hmm. He shall be like a heath in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land and not inhabited. 
In other words, it won't be successful. It won't go well with him. But verse seven says, blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord yeah. and whose hope the Lord is. There's the gospel. Yeah. Those three verses give us the gospel. And then it describes the one who trusts in the Lord in verse eight. And he shall be as a tree. This is another simile. He shall be as a tree planted by the waters and that spreadeth out her roots by the river and shall not see when he cometh. Look at the contrast. The one that doesn't follow the Lord doesn't see when good comes, doesn't even recognize it. But the man or the woman or the person that trusts in the Lord, they won't see when the heat comes. Praise the Lord. But her leaf shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding food. Yeah. Means when the, when there's a lack of water, she will still have plenty. She doesn't have to be uh, rationing water yeah. because she has the care of the Lord is in abundance. Praise the Lord. And then here's a strange statement in verse nine. And 10 and 11. It starts out, the heart is deceitful above all things. Yes. And this is so misunderstood. People take this and try to prove the total depravity of man and that there's no hope for them whatsoever. But let's look at it more closely. The heart is deceitful of, above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, the Lord answers the question. He says, I know it. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Yeah. What are the fruit of his doings? That's what he does. That's what he does. That's works. That's activity. It doesn't say what he believes. It says what he does. Amen. And he gives according to every man's ways. We just described two men. One that didn't follow the Lord and one that does follow the Lord. We gave an example of each one showing the benefit of the one that followed the Lord and showing the destruction or the unsuccess of the one that doesn't follow the Lord. And the Lord gives rewards according to their ways. Amen? Amen. Amen. So it's obvious there's the gospel. People don't see that as a gospel. That's the gospel. It's, it's hallelujah news. Amen. Because He's saying, if you follow me, if you follow me, you won't see when the heat comes. Oh, praise God. What is that referring to? Tribulation. The tribulation, amen. The tribulation period. Say hallelujah, I miss it. Hallelujah. That's the gospel. Why do you miss it? Because we obey the Lord. Because you obey the Lord. You walk in him. Praise the Lord. Now verse 11. As the partridge sits on eggs and hatcheth them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool. There again, it's showing an example of those who do not follow 
the statutes and the word of the Lord. Because it don't look, it's, there's, a, there's four little words in there. Four little words. Let's look at it. As a partridge sitteth on eggs and hatches them not. This is another simile. As the partridge sitteth on the eggs and hatches them not. So he that getteth riches. The next four words tell you what it's talking about. The result of why they don't hatch the eggs. And not by right. They didn't do it legally. They didn't follow the Lord perfectly. He shall leave them in the midst of his days and at his end shall be a fool. Do you think that, it, that the word of God is lying to us? No. Well, what, what is a person that doesn't follow the word of God correctly? What does the Lord say he is? A fool. He's a fool. Yes. He's a fool. Amen. Don't you agree? Yes. You shouldn't have any problem seeing that whatsoever. Amen. So that you know, you understand, it helps you in your walk, does it not? Amen. Who wants to be a fool? Nope. Let me see your hand. Who wants to be a fool? Nobody. <laughs> and not only that, you'll leave them in the midst of your day. So you lose everything. Right in the middle of your lifetime. Amen. This, I try to get people to respond with hallelujahs. I think that's an order. I think the Lord deserves it. Amen. Yes. yes. So it's not just the light comes on, but it, it's, it's, wow, it's a tremendous blessing Amen. for your understanding of life. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. He deserves Hallelujah. it. Yes, he does. Amen. What does hallelujah mean? It's praising him. Hallelujah means praise the Lord. It's in order. Amen. And then in the midst of all of this, look what the next statement is. 12 and 13. And 14. A glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary. Yeah. Hallelujah. All right. Praise the Lord. Did you hear that? How many heard that? Hallelujah. <laughs> A glorious high throne from the beginning. That's what the Lord has in store for those who follow him. He set it up from the beginning. That's what he wants for us from the very beginning. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 13. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be ashamed, and they that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. Hallelujah. That Hallelujah. is the gospel as well, and it is also the part of the gospel that is not given today. Amen. It's a serious thing to forsake the Lord. The he is the fountain of living waters. In him is no darkness at all. Amen. Praise the Lord. There is no other fountain that can give you the living waters. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus, just before he went to his crucifixion, jumped up on the table in the, in the Feast of Tabernacles and said, all oh, those are the thirsty, yes. come here. Come and drink. I come and drink. And, yes. <laughs> and he goes on, like he told the woman at the well. Out of your belly shall flow livers, rivers of living water. Hallelujah. 
So here is the, the righteous cry of Jeremiah on yes. verse 14. Yes. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. All right. Now, here's Jeremiah speaking again, as well as the Lord, because the Lord speaks through him. Behold, they say unto me, where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. See, these people, they couldn't see the Lord's word. They couldn't understand it. They had a tremendous prophet that lived right there in Jerusalem that was constantly prophesying to them these prophecies that had interwoven in them. They had the gospel in them, but they couldn't see it. Where is the word of the Lord? Let it come now. Verse 16, as for me, I have not, this is Jeremiah, as for me, I have not hastened from being a pastor to follow thee. He's saying, Lord, I didn't try to get away from being your servant in pastoring this flock. Neither have I desired the woeful day. I didn't want judgment to come. Thou knowest, colon, thou knowest, colon, that which came out of my lips was right before thee. Amen. Well, hallelujah. He was saying to the Lord, you know, Lord, that I've been faithful and I've been speaking your word to these Amen. people. Hallelujah. So here's what he says. He says, be not a terror unto me. Thou art my hope in the day of evil. Let them be confounded that persecute me, but let not me be confounded. Let them be dismayed, but let not me be dismayed. Bring upon them the day of evil and destroy them with double destruction. That's right. That's what we need to see. That's why if, even in our own situation, we need to see these God haters destroyed. We need to see them pulled down. They're reprobate. That's all there is to it. It's obvious. When you can get involved in pedophilia with young children and in human trafficking and sex trafficking and things like that, don't tell me that there any way, shape, or form that you have any heart towards the Lord. You don't even have a conscience. It's gone. It's sealed over. It needs to be destroyed. Yes, yes. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now, Thank you, Lord. we come to, in verse 19 here, um, we come to the rest of this, it takes a shift here. And it's important shift because it's, it's actually the Lord calling them like, like an altar call, we would say today. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't recognize it as such because it, it's of the way it's worded. It's talking about the Sabbath. But let's look at it uh, closely here. He just said, these people, their sin is so deep, it's even cut in their heart, like the point of a diamond cuts. It's deep. And he says that I'm going to destroy them. 
in all of their borders, I'm going to destroy all their works. He just said that. But now look here. He tells Jeremiah to go tell him to remember to keep the Sabbath. Here's a people that aren't even acting like they're religious. Remember, it's even on the horns of their altars, this sin. Their worship is even. It's not right. Yes. But now he's telling them, remember to keep the Sabbath. Like it was the answer. Well, it is the answer, but not in the way that we may think. So let's look at it. You see what I put at the title? <laughs> Bear no burden on the Sabbath is what the Lord says. Now the Sabbath is what? It's a rest, is it not? Yes. What it means is, what he tells them is, you do not do any labor. That means personal labor. Cease personal labor. Jesus proved that when he constantly healed people on the Sabbath day, just throwing all the the, the uh, Pharisees into a tailspin. They, they couldn't. Yeah. They couldn't accept that because yeah. Yeah. to them Jesus was breaking the Sabbath. But we're going to see here how Jesus looked at it. We're going to see what the Sabbath really means and what we are to do. Jesus was doing works. But he wasn't doing his works. He was doing the work of the Father. So this is like a turn from the old man to the new man. That's a, it's a type. A shadow and a type of the changed person. Turning from the old life to the new life. The new life in Christ. Let me begin by going to Romans 14, the first six verses. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Disputation, excuse me. For one believeth that he might eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth. For God receiveth him. God received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up for God is able to make him stand. Verse five, which definitely is talking about the Sabbath. What one man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now we don't want to get off track here because we know that I think it was uh, the seventh commandment. I'm not quite sure about that order, but was remember to keep the Sabbath holy. It's one of the commandments. Yes. We have to understand what the Lord is saying when he says that because do you agree that the Ten Commandments apply to today? Yes. Yes, yes absolutely. Yes. Verse 6. He that regardeth the day, still speaking about the day. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. Amen? Amen. And he that regardeth not the day, 
to the Lord he doth not regard it. Isn't that true? It says so. Yeah. We don't have to try to figure it out. It says so. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. I went farther than the sixth verse, so that's okay. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Amen. Amen? Amen. Back to the notes. Hallelujah. So let's read verses 19 through the end of the chapter. Thus saith the Lord unto me, go, go and stand in the gate of the children of the people, whereby the kings of Judah can't come in, and by the which they go out, and in all the gates of Jerusalem, and say unto them, Hear ye the word of the Lord, ye kings of Judah and all Judah, and all the inhabitants of, the, of Jerusalem that enter in by these gates. So here we see he's not only including the kings, he's including all the people. He's not only speaking to the people, he's speaking to the kings as well. All that come in and out of this city of Jerusalem. Verse 21, thus saith the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. This again is a type to put off the old man and to put on the new. We'll see that, but let's, let's go ahead and finish that particular verse or thought there, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. So here to, to show you the type, you go to Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. This I say, therefore, you know, it, it, it always, it, since I learned that everything has to be in context, when it says, therefore, I always have to check why it's saying, therefore, there's a reason. So I'm gonna back up a little bit. And it's talking about it's talking about the Lord's ministry. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And here's the reason for these offices for the perfecting of the saints. You would think a saint would be perfect, but this is saying for the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the purpose for these offices in the Lord's ministry. Amen. And here is the reason to further the purpose. Till we all come. Say we. we. So it's talking about the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers need each other as well. It's talking about this ministry. Till we all come 
in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man. What does it mean, a perfect man? It means mature, complete. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Remember how we started out that Paul was saying, I don't count myself as of apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget what's going on, what went on behind, and I press towards the mark for the prize, for the full calling of God in Christ Jesus. This is what it's saying, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. This is the, this is the heart of God revealing to us the importance of the ministries of the church. Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, false doctrines, by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, which is the work of the enemy, the infiltration into the church to disrupt and to corrupt. That's the work of Satan. And he does it consistently unless we fulfill all of our duties as led of the Lord, of the not only the people, <laughs> but the ministers of the gospel. Amen. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him, into him, in all things which is the head, even Christ. Amen. So this is pointing that we're headed to the fullness of the stature of Christ. Yes. In other words, that we represent him, we look like him. Mm -hmm. We resemble him. Amen. Every one of us, I'm sure, I know I have, I've always, I, I remember saying, uh, I, I hope that they see Christ in me. Right. <laughs> Well, this tells us how, how this is uh, possible. Amen. Speaking of Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplied. So it's the activity of the body, the members of the body, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. It's, it's like the, the, the human body. Every part in your body is vitally important for the full function of ourselves. Right. Isn't that true? Yes. And this is what it is describing. This is another metaphorical uh, example according to the effectual working in the measure of every part. It's talking about, it's not talking about going to church and sitting on the pew. It's talking about the activity, the function Amen. of each member in this body of Christ. It's talking about their life, what they do, how they live. And as such, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. If, if the body is functioning as the, the way that God has designed it, it's an increasing body in the Lord of love. Amen. Now, I think on the on the 
Yeah, now we, now we come, now we come to the verses that I started with. This I say, therefore. Isn't it important that we learned what therefore means in this particular example? Yes. Therefore, now, we know why the Lord wants us to be perfect. He wants us to be active. And the, the purpose of the ministry and how this all comes together. So verse 17, this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth, which means from now on, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. How can you say that we have no responsibility for our life after we receive Christ? How can you say that? How can you even think that? Look what happens to these Gentiles. I mean, it's talking about the Gentiles. This you can relate to saved and unsaved, can't we? Mm -hmm. It is speaking to the church, but it's saying the Gentiles or those who are unsaved, they walk in the vanity of their mind. Verse 18, having their understanding darkened. They just don't get it. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. They don't know it. They're ignorant. Can you remember it when you were that way in the Lord? Amen. That's right. And the, the terrible lifestyle that you were involved in because of the blindness of their heart. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness and greediness. That's a description. Verse 20 says, but, but ye have not so learned Christ. So that's not Christ, is it? No. no. If so be that you have heard him. Have you heard the Lord? How did you hear from the Lord? Yes, your Bible. And have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. It's in nothing else. It's not, I'm not saying that some things aren't correct, but the truth, you cannot rely on books from other people, although they may be good books, as the truth. The truth is in Jesus. Amen. The truth is in Jesus. Verse 22, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Can you see the parallel now with Jeremiah chapter 17? Amen. Yes, you put that off. You put off the old man and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Remember, they didn't know it. It just described here in Ephesians. These people don't even know it. In Jeremiah, we read, they don't even know when good comes. They just don't get it. So they have to be renewed in the spirit of their mind so that they're open to the word of God so they can receive the word of God. They have to believe in the Lord. And if they believe in the Lord, then they'll follow in the Lord. Amen? Amen. And that's what verse 24 says. And that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Hallelujah. This again is the gospel. The Bible is the gospel. Yes. Put on the new man. This, it's not once saved, always saved. We just read where they can depart from the Lord, from the fountains of living waters. Praise the Lord. Yes, hallelujah. All right.
Now, verse 22, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your fathers. Verse 23, but they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff that they might not hear nor receive instruction. I want to take you to John 19. This is Jesus has just died in verse 30 on the cross. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, meaning the day preparing for the Sabbath, the Sabbath is coming, and their Sabbath started at 6 p.m., that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for the, that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the Jews wanted Pilate to break the legs of the people that were crucified so that they could be taken care of, they could die right away, so that they could be through before the beginning of the Sabbath because Jesus passed away somewhere around 3 p.m. and Sabbath starts in the 6th, or excuse me, 6 p.m. Verse 32, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record. The title of the, the author of this book is John and he's referring to himself. John saying, I saw it. And I bear record. And his record is true. And he knoweth that he said, and he knoweth that he saith true that you might believe. For, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith they shall look on him whom they pierced. So that this is the fulfillment of the scriptures when they uh, were not allowed to break Jesus' legs and they pierced his side. Remember what flowed out when they pierced his side? Blood and water, signifying the power of the blood and also of the water all the way through the word of God, the living water flowed down that cross to the earth to bring it the blessing of the result of the blood of Christ and the living water, hallelujah. Verse 38, and after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as a manner of the Jews is to bury. 
So here's these two men, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. And both of them Jews, both of them Pharisees, but both of them followers of Jesus. They knew the Sabbath was about ready to happen, but they went ahead and took care of the body of Jesus. All right. They weren't concerned about it. They were concerned more about Jesus. I believe that they were beginning to see the purpose of the Sabbath. Verse 24, and it shall come to pass, if ye diligently hearken unto me, saith the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hollow the, the Sabbath day, to do no work therein, then shall there enter into the gates of the city kings and princes, sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Judah, Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. That's pointing to the kingdom, that thousand year rest. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places about Jerusalem and from the land of Benjamin and from the plain and from the mountains and from the south, from all over, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices and meat offerings and incense and bringing sacrifices of praise unto the house of the Lord. That's speaking about the kingdom. That's looking forward to the kingdom. So now you can understand what the Lord is saying. You begin to understand it. When you know he started out by saying, these people have gone too far. Their sin is so deep that it's written with an with a iron pen with a point of a diamond. But he gives them the opportunity and says, cursed is a man that make man his the strength of arm, right. but blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord Amen. and gives you the examples that we went through. But if ye will not hearken unto me to hollow the Sabbath day and not to bear a burden, even entering into the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. So what is this speaking of? Remember, it's speaking about the changed life, about a holy life. But the Sabbath day was to spend time with the Lord. Everything the Lord had them to do, like the Old Testament sacrifices, everything that he had them do all pointed to Christ, didn't it? Mm -hmm. Even in the tabernacle, the bread, the candles, candlestick, the altars, the, the labor, where they were to cleanse, all of it pointed to Christ. And the beginning, the sacrificial altar, where they, they killed the, the animals, the blood of Christ. It all pointed to Christ. So does the Sabbath. Christ is our Sabbath. Christ is our rest. You've experienced that. You know that is true. You know that in Christ you have peace. Amen. When you start thinking about everything else, you don't have peace. Amen. But if you stay in Christ, Amen. you have peace. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Now, Thank you. it's getting late. Hebrews 3 and Hebrews 4. I'm going to turn to them and thumb through them because there's some points. 
I told you this is all about Christ. The first verse says, wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. Who's he talking to? Uh, Say me, right. Me. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Amen. Again, it all points to Christ. It talks about him being faithful, more faithful than Moses. Talks about him being uh, uh, it, it talks talks about him being uh, having preeminence over all things and uh, it talks about him being Christ as a son over his own house you are the house of God right He's talking about, if I read all of those verses, he's talking about Moses and Christ. It's comparing them. And he's saying that, that Christ is the creator. He's talking about us. everybody, somebody builds a house. Yeah. But God is a maker of all things. So he's talking about this house. We are the house here that he's talking about. The house of the Lord. The tabernacle of the Lord. Verse 6 says it, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? And then the condition, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. There's the condition. It's not just simply one saved, always saved without yeah. responsibility. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. He's referring to us. He's referring back to the children of Israel that hardened their hearts when he spoke to them in the wilderness. Remember that example? And he's saying, they tempted me. So I swear in my wrath, they sh verse 11, they shall not enter into my rest. Are we talking about a Sabbath? Are we talking about a rest? It says a rest. We're talking about the kingdom. That's where our rest is. They shall not enter into my rest. If you're not going to follow Christ, you're not going to go into the kingdom. Amen. The scriptures prove that, isn't it true? Yes. So you know the truth. There's there is absolutely no doubt about this. And it's 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 God's conviction to just hammer it in you so that you understand and don't forget. It is. It's all the way through the word, it must be. It's repeated over and over and over. So then verse 12, take heed, brethren, talking to us, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, unbelief in departing from the living God. It has belief in there, but it, it's belief, it's unbelief rather, but it has works also. What is the work? What are the works? departing from the living God. Unbelief departs from the living God. But what we're supposed to do, exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How can anybody think that the salvation can accompany sin, a sinful life. Look what it says. Amen. Sin is deceitful. Amen. You can't enter the kingdom because of sin. Because if you, if you sin, that says you don't believe me because I say I'm not going to let you in if you sin. But people think they can anyway because they rely on one or two verses. They rely on the verse that says, 
All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. They rely on verses, but not the context of the Bible, the full gospel message. Okay. So, and then chapter four, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Do you see what I mean about the Lord is just repetitious, repeating over and over and over, talking about he wants us to enter into that rest. The, the way into the rest is through Jesus and the rest is the kingdom where Jesus is the king. Amen? Amen. We have the, the rest in Jesus, but we're going to see the need to seek it in just a moment. I'm going to leave this because of time's sake and go to Colossians 2. This is a fantastic message. You might, if the Lord inspires you to do so, take the notes of this and, and study those scriptures that we put in there because they will really solidify this message in your heart. Colossians 2, verse 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. <clears throat> what a statement from the Apostle Paul. He's saying, I've got a great conflict about you. For you and Laodicea and all that haven't seen me. Verse two, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. There again, it's a true heart of God that's in, in this apostle because he knows he has to, it just has to, the conflict in him is that people just so, don't seem to get it. It's a conflict. And he just desires that everybody would come and hear him speak. And that's the heart of God. He's speaking to the people, but they won't receive his words. They won't take it. Verse four, and this I say, lest any man beguile you through with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So he's saying, I know you love me. Verse six, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. Amen. If they were walking in him, he wouldn't have had to make that statement. Right. That's what he's saying. This is the conflict. They're religious. They're acting like they love the Lord, but they're not walking him in him. Amen. The instruction is receive the Lord, walk in him, and then verse 7 rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught. Hallelujah. Abounding. Hallelujah. Abounding yes, therein with thanksgiving. That's the hallelujah. Yes. That's the hallelujah attitude. That's a hallelujah lifestyle. Yes. That's a hallelujah yes. individual. Hallelujah. Verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men and after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Because there's all kinds of things 
that the enemy wants to use, that he will use men to do, to discourage us. Philosophy, vain deceit, tradition of men, rudiments of the world. Verse 9, for in him, Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, the old man, by the circumcision of Christ. This is speaking of a circumcision of the heart. So we see the circumcision of the Old Testament was a type of the true circumcision that comes in Christ, which includes not only males, but females. It's everyone. Circumcision of the heart. The hardness of the heart comes away. The 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 uh, the covering of the heart comes away. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Don't think about the, the ritual or the ceremony, I won't call this ritual, the ceremony of baptism. Look, look, look at what he's saying. You are buried with him. You are baptized with him. You go down. That, that going down in the water is a, is a shadow and a type of dying with Christ. Wherein you are also risen. And you rise out of that water. You are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. So that baptism is not only your declaration of that you are through with the world and you're going to walk now with God, but it's also, if received properly, God is able to cut away that hard heart. The operation, it's an operation of God. Verse 13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcised of your flesh hath he quickened, made alive, together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. I didn't hear any hallelujahs. All right, here we go. I'm finishing here. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Here you're going to see how this is applicable to the message today. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing to his cross, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Hmm. Because you understand what the Sabbath is all about. Yeah, in other words, you, it, it's not wrong for you to keep the Sabbath, to shut yourself off from the world and just seek the Lord all day on Sabbath, on Saturday. But it's not a requirement of the Lord because he's requiring that of you for every day that you are to live in Christ every day. You are to walk with him every day. 
Jesus proved this when he did all that work, the Father's work, on the Sabbath. And he said, Sabbath, man wasn't made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath day was made for man. That man might shut off the world and seek the Lord and walk in the Lord. Talking about verse 16, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of the holy day or a new moon or the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There you have it. That's where your rest is. It's in Christ. All of those are a shadow of things to come. All right. Let's, let's close with a joyful hallelujah to the Lord. Father, we rejoice in the fact that we are free today to walk in you. Because you have provided for us the blood of Christ, the blessed Holy Spirit, the word of God, Jesus, you have provided for us everything. And that we can, by choice, because of our love for you and our faith in you, to return your love for us and walk in you, to be pleasing to you, that we may receive that eternal life and that peace of God that is all wrapped up in the kingdom of God, which is also Christ. Christ in us, the hope of glory, and the kingdom that shall come with Christ is our king, ruling and reigning forever and ever. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. We love you. Amen.